welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Stan. I'd like to welcome all of you to the college tonight. The College of Complex consists of the following format. There will be a brief announcements period. Then we shall have our speaker on the air. Then we shall have our... After our speaker speaks, we will then have a question and answer period, followed by a rebuttal period. And I can introduce you. I'm pleased to introduce a long, many, a friend of many, many years involved in, in international affairs. And you were also had an organization regarding Illinois issues, fiscal responsibility, uh, many years of dedication, and possibly one of the more better read people that I'm acquainted with. She's kind enough on occasions that you see magazines left behind on our table. That's Margaret who's passing on her reading literature. She's also the author of two books. One is The Selfishness System, and what's the other one? Making Decisions uh, that don't, Hurt Others. That don't hurt, making decisions that don't hurt others. So, okay, there, that was nice. That was yeah. Nice. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so yeah, what's the deal? Oh, are you opposed to that? All right, let's look at my speaker. Even though she's a nice job, Charlie. <laughs> nice job, Charlie. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I am going to just pull it down and it should be no trouble. Can you hear me? Is this? Yeah. It should. It should be. Uh, not, please. It doesn't stay down. Uh, so why are we so often stuck with the status quo? From the Illinois Department of Human Services to the struggle to get <clears throat> fair redistricting of our electoral districts, to the United Nations Security Council's flaws, much never gets reformed. All possible efficacy accomplishes uh, little, very little, and be fighting forever. Authorities merely tw um, tweak the system or claim they will satisfy demands but never do. The following are examples of problems that any rational person knows should have been taken care of but weren't. The Illinois Department of Human Services has been chastised for the failure to supervise the agencies that run group homes for handicapped people. These homes uh, which, uh, for which taxpayers pay approximately $50,000 per resident per year are frequently poorly run and have reports of abuse and seem to be accountable to no one. The United Nations Security Council, Council has had its hands tied um, that from the founding of the United Nations by the veto power of its five permanent members of which the United States is one. Viable solutions to problems have been blocked by a veto-wielding power blocking them because they are counter to their own nationalistic interests, not because they were unworkable solutions. So much for the common good. Then there's a struggle to have redistricting of electoral districts every 10 years done in this country by impartial professional bodies rather than self-serving state legislators. Legislatures. Okay. We've seen the long struggle yeah, by civic groups in Illinois, such as the League of Women Voters, to get this done by means of a constitutional amendment. A representative of one such group even spoke at the College of Complexes on this topic. All of the activity was to no uh, avail, yet, yet um, the General Assembly, one attempt gets on the ballot, which is the Constitutional Amendment, a graduated income tax, which I totally support, I think we should have it, but how come they can't get any other worthy causes that require constitutional amendments on the ballot? 
Why can't this be done? This is, I mean, we are stuck in the middle of nowhere. There have been years of advocacy in Illinois, including by the League of Women Voters, to have our judges merit selected rather than elected with a response the possibility for voters to intelligently select from long lists of candidates. Moreover, in addition, when campaign contributions can influence judges' decisions and other, and uh, they can uh, issue harsher sentences to garner votes. Then we have the problem of endless election seasons, which are so unnecessary. A simple reform that no one can seem to manage would be to limit the time between primaries and general elections to, let's say, about two months. Obvious? Can't get done. Can't be done. Can't be changed. Now consider the fact that the Social Security Administration is starting to pay out more in benefits than it receives in revenue from the payroll, payroll deductions, thus having to withdraw money from its trust, its trust fund to pay full benefits. Yet attempts to remove caps on income subject to payroll taxes, one of the uh, partial solution at least to this problem, have been attempted over and over again, can't be done. Isn't done. Right now we have consistently this has failed. At this point, only the first $132,900 of an employee's income is subject to this tax. The trust fund will be used up by 2034. Benefits will consequently need to be reduced as the only source of uh, um, for the paying them will be payroll deductions. I don't think anyone planned it this way, but all the indifference and foot dragging and nobody gives a boot, but anyway. Also, Medi the Medicare trust fund will also be exhausted, and that will be 2026, and Medicare benefits will be reduced. Nothing is being done. Yeah. Now let's consider the United States military establishment, whose hardware so exceeds that of China and Russia that these countries could never expect to keep up with it. Yet excessive U.S. military spending goes up year after year. For fiscal year 2019, it will be $716 billion. With the latest excuse being that we have to protect ourselves from Russia and China. Yeah, you're right. Of course, what actually drives the military spending is the military industrial complex. And the right wing nationalists and campaign contributions to members of Congress. Nothing to do with the common good, absolutely nothing to do with the special interest groups. Lockheed Martin Corporation, our number one defense contractor, has made sure to have 500 suppliers in 46 states. The better to get members of Congress, to have more members in Congress from whose states uh, they are who will be spending money, and who say they will be spending money. For fiscal year 2019, Congress appropriated not $9.34 billion for 93 F-35 jets, 60 more than requested by the Pentagon. There is a goal of requiring 2,456 of these planes, yet the Secretary of Defense has concerns about the high cost of operating and maintaining such a multi-billion dollar weapon system. So we know who's driving all the terrible military spending. It's actually the Pentagon.
Pentagon is more conservative than Congress. There is the... This is the largest of these plays procurement program in the Department of Defense history. We are also in the process of acquiring four new aircraft carriers costing $55 billion. In addition, this is in addition to the 10 we already have. An organization called the Project on Government Oversight, to which I do donate, has been publicizing details of this Pentagon waste from at least the 1980s, so there's no excuse for people not to be aware of it. Certainly members of Congress, well they don't care. In addition to huge Pentagon spending, the Department of Energy spends billions on nuclear weapons and is now engaged in a new nuclear arms race started even under Obama using new nuclear warheads. Thank you. This leads into our unaddressed problem of the rising federal deficit spending year in and year out, which for fiscal year 2018 was $779 billion. This has resulted in a steady increase in our national debt, which has risen from $6 trillion in 1998 to $22 trillion in 2019. Can this possibly be right? I mean, I mean, morally right. The interest on this debt reached one and a half billion dollars per day in 2017. Deficits could easily be ended just by eliminating most federal tax credits and deductions, which bring at least one trillion dollars annually from the Treasury. Also, of course, wasteful Pentagon spending and duplicative agencies, and I think there's something like eight different intelligence agencies that's all over there that um, perform the same thing could be reined in. Just common sense, but it won't get changed. The logical, rational thing won't be done. The estate tax, which, which was seen to be the fairest tax possible, has been consistently lowered so that now, for a single person's estate, the estate tax will not kick in until uh, the estate exceeds $11.2 million. Don't tax the first a little bit. Why? Why not? Does anyone have any reasonability? I mean, I just, it's impossible to believe these things. Our financially strapped postal service has been striving for years to eliminate Saturday delivery, to save money. Common sense, right. But has been prohibited from doing this by Congress. Wildfires regularly devastate parts of California, when U.S. taxpayers pay the resulting of emergency, um, emergency service. Yet such vulnerable areas continue to see new construction. The same is true of coastal areas in Florida, subject to worsening hurricanes due to global warming. Such areas are immediately rebuilt. Rebuilt on the same area. You rebuild all again. Wait till the next hurricane. And uh, including um, homes that have been insured by subsidized, uh, that is subsidized by the U.S. taxpayers, flood insurance. Subsidized. Our tax money. Yes, everybody should know that such abuses should be eliminated, but apparently they never will be. Just remember, the longer one puts off some of these problems, the harder it will be to deal with the consequences of not resolving them. Just think of the federal 
somebody somewhere down the line is going to have to deal with that twenty-two trillion dollar management debt and all the, some of these other things. That's it. I've heard, I, I've heard the questions now, right? Yeah, yeah, questions, yeah, yeah. All right, you've talked about, you've talked about the, why we're stuck with the status quo. All you seem to present about was just a bunch of problems. What's your solution to that problem? Well, it's, it's basically that it's selfish as a human nature. People are simply out for themselves. They do not think in terms of the common good. I don't think it's a solution. I don't think anything will ever be so really solid because human nature doesn't allow it. Now, you could think of things, for example, right, or prosaic things like, like, um, like, for example, public funding of campaigns. Absolutely, that might do something. I mean, that would make a sensible reform, but it won't ever be done. So, but that would take the special interest group money, the campaign contribution money, out of the picture. Um, there is no solution until you can find out, do something about what's wrong with human nature. Everybody's out for himself, everybody's out for his group. 90% are, and that's what it is. Members of Congress are not there to serve this country. They're not. <coughs> They're not, they're not there, Congress is not, does not exist to serve our country. The Constitution says they should, of course, but they don't. Okay, who's next? Why don't they? Because they're too selfish. <coughs> you're serving the special interest. Did you have, oh, oh. yes. Well I, well, I think the influx of these immigrants and refugees coming over the border is really a plan by George Soros and the UN to destabilize, destabilize the United States and make us weaker. What do you think? I disagree totally. I think immigrants are an asset. They really, yeah, asset. they actually, no, they would do, look, everybody here is probably descended from immigrants. Yeah, they're 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 probably descended from uh, some of these people are very ambitious and really contribute a lot. They're more likely to be entrepreneurs than the Native Americans, I understand. They're bringing diseases and <laughs> disease, crime, drugs, they're bringing No, that's not true. That's, that's not true at all. No, there are no diseases here. <laughs> no, we don't have the bullets. Come on! The rich people do this to us. The rich, the rich is the rich of the poor, the poor. So the rich people have all the power. Um, to some extent, but it's not necessarily that. It's special interest groups as, as such. For example, your, uh, the NRA, they're not necessarily rich. But they're organized to serve that one service, that all number one issue that only they matter and what they want matters. So that's not necessarily the rich, I you can't blame everything on the rich people. Not every rich person is a horrible person. Anyway, remember there were some good ones too, like Bloomberg and, and uh, what's his other, his other name? Um, I can't think of the guy from Hungary. And, and they're, they're really out there using their money for good and trying to bring reform. And they're really outstanding. And they're, they're using their money very um, um, constructively. So they're on the right side. I can't, can't be against somebody just because they're rich. I can't, you, we can't do that. Um. <laughs> I, I have a solution, but I don't know how to implement it. I suggest that we need a dollar matching program. So for every dollar spent lobbying into our Congress or money paying off bribes at, uh, to get legislation passed for the military, they should match a dollar and put it into our um, Medicare and Social Security fund. Yeah. So how would you how would you initiate that? I'm not really following what you're saying. I'm saying if somebody, I mean, obviously a lot of money is being spent in order to to uh, get Congress to vote the way they want, right? 
Right. All right. So if we pass a law as the people of this country and say, hey, for every dollar that you people accept, you know, for special interest groups, you got to match it. One dollar for one dollar into our social services. I don't know. I don't know. First of all, they probably don't even admit the kind of donations they get. It could be, you know, the sly and that. Then they should have their income tax audited. Yeah, well, you know what? Speaking of the Obama, Obama declared his return. He made $5 million one year. $5 million, aside from his salary as the president. But you know what? Under the, under the Trump administration, they've cut down on the IRS personnel, so they're not even being able to do as much. It's a stupid thing. It's short-sighted because they're missing a lot of cheating and that because they don't have the personnel to, to go after it. So it's... Well, we need, a, you know, we, need to get, we need to get a referendum on all the ballots. Huh. You know, we, right? we need a referendum on all the ballots in all the states so that it get, gets in front of the politicians. Yeah. We need a referendum. Yeah, we need a referendum. Give us a good government that works for us. Yes, Charlie, I guess you're next. Yeah, Margaret, how do you know that your definition of human nature is, is accurate? Much of the legislation that's passed is passed to benefit other people, like the fighting forest fires that Pat is voted for by the legislators. I'm not hearing you, Charlie. I'm not hearing you. How do you know that your definition of human nature is correct? Much of the legislation that is passed does not benefit the people who vote for it, like the forest fires were voted for by the legislators from Illinois to benefit the people of California and the West. And people vote to support public transit who don't live in cities. So there's a lot of altru... And the other thing is, in, in, in evolution, the one problem that Darwin had was that they discovered in human beings there's altruistic behavior, and a lot of it. Is that true? I mean, none of this is true. All you got to do is live a long time, and you see, I mean, year in and year out, and it actually even seems to be getting worse. No maybe it's just because I'm an old lady, but it seems to me, I don't see so much selfishness when I was young. I mean, to me, it's, and they're saying it's the kind of society we're in, because, you know, if you've ever read the uh, Bowling Alone, it's a wonderful book that says, after TV came out and everybody had TV in their homes, they turned inward. All that matter was what was happening within the four walls of their home. And they got away from civic involvement and uh, concern. And there used to be much more civic involvement in the past. And you go back even in the 1800s, the people and the women there and, the, and everything, you know, well, the middle class women who were free to do it and they were working on good causes and getting playgrounds and getting uh, child. Um, uh, you know, getting rid of child labor and that. So, but uh, but in my opinion, at this stage, and in not just this country either, everywhere it's very very selfish. I mean, people are just first and foremost out for themselves, and that's the only explanation as to why these things. You say people vote for things that don't. Uh, benefit them directly, but indirectly it probably does. Like a member of Congress may not have a gun, but he's voting for the gun lobby to get himself reelected. Your safety doesn't matter, my safety doesn't matter. When he's getting reelected matters, it's all that matters. Um, I don't even know who's enough. I guess, I guess you can. You were saying about the, down in the hurricane zones and the fire zones, They've also shown that there was homes built to uh, such a high standard, they survived no problem. The, re the real problem is we need to raise up the standards when you build in those areas. Good point. That's a good point. I never thought of that. But, uh, yeah, it's true. Okay, so. Yeah, like in the middle. So the point would be, sir. Yeah, talking to you. Yeah. Okay, either build to those higher standards, but don't otherwise build. If you're going to build in, in oh, yeah. areas, if you go to the areas, build to the higher standards. If you can do that, fine. Or if you don't build to it, 
and you lose your house, you're tough luck. More government regulation, right? Right, and you're tough luck. That's right. You lose your house. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And it shouldn't be the taxpayers or anybody coming in to rebuild for you if you didn't build correctly. Well, not just taxpayers. It's conditional. You wouldn't get the insurance. So we need more right. government regulation. More government regulation. You know what? They get the insurance anyway. It's terrible. Subsidized insurance. It doesn't matter if you're rebuilding the same house in the same place. You still get it. Yeah, but if you cut out the subsidies to the insurance companies. To, to the, it's to the, to, uh, to the, to the, uh, you know, the one that gets the insurance is getting the subsidy, yeah. Yeah, cut yeah, right, right. The, first, yeah, the, the homeowner, you know, is, is not paying as much as he should for the risk involved, you see. Yeah, especially if he doesn't build up to the high standards. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Sure. So you don't yeah. want to help you? Uh, well, I have it. Both of you are spoken already. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. All right, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, and that was actually a good I like your concept, and to me, though, it's not selfish. It's about, it's the system. The, the virtue of selfishness was pushed by the neoconservatives under Ayn Rand and, and the Republicans, the libertarians. They, when you, they, it's kind of a covert, propaganda campaign that was pushed by the fascist actually let's you know that everything's for selfishness right and then from the supply side like you know let's just assume that man is a selfish animal and and play take out all the What's the regulations against yeah. that um, the problem well, is what's the question well I am I'm addressing some of the same things that were brought up I guess would you, you the, I think based on that assumption, maybe there's an opportunity for regulation and honest services that... Bring it up during the rebuttals. You can have systematically, things were more regulated for honest services, corruption, transparency. These things were taken out of the regulations by a deliberate deregulation policy. I think we just have to put them back Watch in. Questions. Watch the Watch questions. Watch the questions. Do we need more government I agree. regulation? You know, if this lady could sit down and I could really speak to you. Do you mind if... Uh, I agree. First of all, I, I want to make it clear. It doesn't matter whether you're a right-wing uh, Republican or a left-wing uh, union member or whatever, because you know, all of them are selfish. But what I agree with what you're saying is, um, oh boy, is, is that the regulations and what we do see, I, I mean, look, let's take it like this. Human nature is selfish, it does need to be regulated, and we do need much more, and the Republicans, and especially Trump, is, you know, the environment and everything have been deregulated. And there's no question, I mean, you really have a good point that, that, that human nature being this way, it does, we do need regulation. We need a lot of regulation, and that's the, that, I guess, is the only solution. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Well, this uh, rep Representative Cortez and the Green New Deal say it's the end of the world in 12 years. Do you really believe that? No. Uh, Nostradamus was saying that a thousand years ago. Yeah. I, I believe, uh, not the end of the world, but I think things are going to bad, very down, very not badly. And, and I don't think life is, I mean, I'm glad I'm old because I think, you know, 10 or 15 years from now, things will go. In my opinion, this is maybe a little far out, but in my opinion, we kind of reached the peak, our peak in, nine, in the 1980s. And that was the point at which we finally had, you know, black people were no longer, you know, being pushed around so much and we made a lot of progress, you know, for their rights and, and other things. But in my opinion, with the growth of the um, Facebook and things like that, everything is going down. People are getting more and more inward-looking. They already were too inward-looking because
cameras or the TV thing. Now they're, they're buried in a, in a cell phone all the time. They hardly know what's going by. You're going down the side of You got right on the bus or the L. Everybody has their face buried in a uh, cell phone. What, what about the world around you? I mean, just looking at for your own self all the time. Yeah, if you want to say something. Yeah, I want to say that if you look at the policies of the left versus the right, I, I, the left wing has always been more self-conscious, self, uh, selfless, you know, socially conscious, and the right wing was achievement. And as long as you had a balance, that was good. And I think that's what the party, you know, propaganda will tell us, that, you know, yeah, we're both for that. Um, but reality is I think the social conscience was really let go of um, and you know with and it'll come trickling down like you know if you just give it all James Burnham had the managers revolution like it was really a counter revolution so that the managers are and it doesn't trickle down that's the truth there's no incentive for I think they pushed it in the 20s with the policies. The women got the votes, and they really pushed back on the banksters. What's the question? What's your I, question? I, I, What's your question? She has any... <coughs> Listen, cool it, Tim, okay? You know what I'm talking about. I know like, exactly yeah. what's the question. Okay, the question yeah, it's is about brother. regulation yeah, it's and political battle. policy that comes from the political parties, and that is a left and right situation. Would you agree with me, or would you speak to that, please? Uh, I think I said before, I do believe you're correct that more regulation, and it is, you're right, the facts are that it's the Republicans that do not, that always want less regulation, and the Democrats more, and you just look at the environment, for example, environmental regulations. However, we do have to understand, I mean, the, and I'm a Democrat, but I, I can't say I agree with everything they're coming up with. I mean, look, we have the $22 trillion national debt. Now, Democrats are always running around looking for more ways to spend money and more issues and free college education and stuff like that. And that I don't agree with. I, I agree with the, the basic, like you say, humaneness, you know, of, of you know, uh, people, equal rights and stuff like that. But you can't go crazy with the spending. And the Democrats, if I'm not sorry, have a tendency to do this. Of course, the Republicans have this thing of not wanting to tax. So they're both wrong. And they want the war. The well, yeah, but they, they don't even want to pay, I mean, they want to cut taxes. And you can't cut, ta you have, how are you supposed to pay? I mean, obviously we're not paying. We have this, this terrible, these terrible debts, these terrible deficits. It's very serious. They scream. You are already spoke. Well, I get more Wait a minute, here's, no, this lady did not ask a question yet. Okay. I was just wondering, um, no, do you think no, that no. Um, a solution would be to um, for the left and the right to come together instead of arguing all the time and fighting and like have a compromise, the good points from the Democrats and the good points from the Republicans. Wonderful, but who's going to do it? They're not going to do that. They're not going to do that. You're too selfish to do that. You're right. We should, have big, uh, we should have a big conference and, and the left and right, you know, I mean, wonderful, but how do you get that done? You know, everybody wants their own way. Grab this uh, All right. Uh, this man. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I think the big problem with the public, they want all kinds of benefits, but they don't want to pay for them. Something that happened uh, several years ago along the Plains River, these houses would flood every other year or so. So what they did, did is eventually uh, condemned them all and turned it into forest preserves. What we mean is more things like, like that. Uh, if your place floods two, year, two years in a row or three years in a row, you get no more public flood insurance. Uh, if you have a forest fire every other year, outlaw building in the, that area. What do you think of that? I, you know, there were dishes rattling, and I, I not, didn't hear all of it, but you said, said about public flood insurance. Uh, that's actually not good from what is what we're talking about. It's subsidized the, 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 uh, on the federal level. I don't know if it's anywhere else. And they subsidize it, and it just 
doesn't, it doesn't, it's an incentive for people to just be careless and build environmental well, places. Well, it makes no sense. But I, the rest of your question, I didn't quite, what was that about forest uh, preserves? I didn't get that. Well, uh, People keep having a problem in the area. Well, condemn those houses and get them out of there and don't let anybody go. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know, what yeah. do you think of that? Yeah, they do that. There yeah, are yeah. some places where they're doing that. In North Carolina, I read, yeah, and they pay them to um, to turn over their house, and the house in those vulnerable areas is torn down. You're right. And that's a very good uh, approach. Should there yeah. be more of that? Yeah, they should do more of it, right. Yes, Charlie. 90% demographically of the population of the United States lives adjacent to a nearby a body of water. Are you able to maintaining the path to be some mass migration yes. in the well, United States? Come on, come States? on, let's use our common sense. I mean, this thing this no, is going you, on No, you use common for sense. Decades. You where you where you? 90% of the people live near a body of water. I don't believe it, but in any case, even if it were two, the point is... The and only you know, city that exists... ...about the Mississippi River flooding, the people still, they have their farms, their homes right near this. I mean, at least go back under a little... The only uh, major city in the United some States... some common sense. The only major city in the United States, not on a river or lake, is Atlanta. Every other city is. They're all part of the body of water. Know, and the ocean is rising. Right and you're supposed to move everybody. Of course. Just by using common sense when you're doing these things. We're going to build all the houses for all the 90% of the people in the United States. I think they're going to pay. Okay. Are we through? <laughs> I got one more. Please. Good guy. All right. Yeah. Who does? Um, I got. Oh. Okay. You know, tomorrow morning, you say I kind of agree with you to a certain extent that people kind of are selfish in their own interest, but I also have seen a lot of hope. Because I go, I'll be, tomorrow morning I'll be in a church with a really good group of caring people. And I'm just wondering, when was the last time you had exposure to that kind of environment where, you know, you go into your local church or synagogue and experience hey, some of this? Gene, well, you thank Gene Hawker for this. Uh, I started going to his church. And so far, now I haven't been going a long time. Gene, can you hear me? I'm just I just started. Okay. Uh, but so far they seem really very gracious people. I mean, just I trying to treat each other and their well, philosophy know. they have in the service every day and they say like, you know, be kind to your neighbor kind mm -hmm. of thing and, and, and you know, that seems to be the way they think. And I hope I won't be disappointed so far. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I, I find that myself, there's a lot more positivity being generated now than there was even 30 years ago. Yes. I can't quit. I read somewhere that moral schools, public schools were started to teach people the morality. You know, that was part of the mission, but now there's less investment in education. And so those teaching of, of morality to people at an early age, we may have less of that. Would you agree with that? Or you think that uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with that, but I mean, if it's true, I mean, if it's unfortunate that they have stopped that, yeah, absolutely. And parents are responsible, too. I mean, they should, I know I said this, that parents should be training their children to be more unethical. I mean, it should start, you know, it should start in the home. I'm a preschool teacher. I'm a preschool teacher. Excuse me? I'm a preschool teacher. Oh. I, I teach a lot of kids. And it's down in the home. It's down in the home. If you don't know a teacher by now, growing up, where are they going to be in 20 years? Exactly. That's going to be a free trial. Yeah. In the home. Yes, no. out in the home. That's right. You don't look at school as you teach your kids. The parents of themselves have to teach 
the kid the right way. And from an impressionable age, not not waiting until school age, but even when they're younger. Yeah. That's you know, what they're saying. They set a good example for them. That's they, what they're being saying. Giving and Consider it and everything like that. Set the example. Yeah, yeah it's the parents. Yeah, yeah, all right, there's the answer to it. The parents have to go to get to work and get right in their kids. Get the village. All right, one of you, all right. Uh, how soon is Florida going to be underwater? Florida, the highest point in Florida, is half the elevation that we are at today. And this area was under 50 feet of water a few thousand years ago. Right where we are. No. The, the highest point in Florida is half? It's half our elevation. Our 340, elevation. Wow. 345 wow. feet. And mm -hmm. that's the highest point in Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, right here, we sit at about 600 feet above sea level. Mm -hmm. so what? Which? Above sea level. Above sea level. Oh, we're 600 feet. Oh, is it? Above sea level. Oh, yeah? oh. Chicago is 600 feet above sea level. Oh, it is? Oh, okay. okay. The highest point in Florida is only 345 feet above oh. sea level. That's the highest point. Most of Florida is below 100 feet above sea level. And at this point, several thousand years ago, where we're sitting today was under 50, 60 feet of water. And isn't there something about the, that Florida that is sinking too? I think I heard something like that, or the parts of it are sinking. No, it's terrible. The water level is raising. What? Michigan is up four feet in the last seven years. All right. What's the last seven years? What? Lake Michigan has risen four feet in the last seven years. But Michigan is up and down. I remember this over the years. It's, it's normal. But that's not global warming. It's normal to go up and down. Lake Michigan, that's what I remember. Who says it's going to stop at four feet? My well, I mean, maybe it's changed now, but the over history, you know, it's been yeah. normal for it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. It's up four feet. It went down ten years ago. That's up four feet now. Are you guys done? What's nah. the More like fencing. Yeah, what is the question? That's what I thought. It was up and down. Yeah. Well, we had some fresh spring, too. It's not a sea level. Issue. All right, I'm going to ask a question. Let's get some more back to order. All right. Margaret, you've had this thing about bowling alone. For centuries since Gutenberg, people have been sitting alone reading books. Then they got radios, and they listened to radios. Then you think they got TVs. So what's the big difference? They got a neighborhood pub. They haven't, yeah, they haven't changed. The difference between, what, between radio, you mean, and, well, radio. Well, they read books. I know, but that's not, you're part of. It's not. I, if you're watching TV, you're by yourself. What do you want to put? You're by yourself, but you are interacting with another person's mind. Oh, a lot. It's, it's what's the difference between what's the difference between reading a book and an iPhone? Getting into your mind and watching TV is just does not bring anything. Well, the difference between reading a book and an iPhone? Well, the difference between reading a book and an iPhone? Well, the difference between reading a book and an iPhone? Well, the difference between reading a book and an iPhone? Well, the difference between reading a book and an iPhone? Well, the difference between reading a book and an iPhone? Well, the difference between reading a book and an iPhone? Well, the difference between reading a book and an iPhone? Well, the difference between reading a book and an iPhone? Well, the difference between reading a book and an iPhone? Well, the difference between reading a book and an iPhone? Well, the difference between reading a book and an iPhone? Well, the difference between reading a book and an iPhone? Internet. Wow. No TV, right? Are you guys TV? People sit on the L and the, the, the whole world is, they're oblivious. The whole world is just what's in front of them and there's some silly, nonsensical, and how, what's on the cell phones anyway? I have one, it's nonsense. Except that you get emails from groups. I get a lot of emails from Well, Margaret, you can tailor whatever you get on your own data, your own computer. Yeah. What's that? You're blaming confused for what's on it? Oh, come on. Okay. Do you play with yourself? No. You can control what you log into. What? We'll talk about that On later. an iPhone. What's your question, Charlie? She says somehow there's a set amount of information. Hey, let me finish, please. What's your question? I don't know. What are you talking about? I don't know anything about iPhones. That there's a big set of information. Charlie, what's your question? What's your question, Charlie? What is the information? I, you look up things on the iPhone. You control it. It's not, it doesn't control you. 
Okay. Margaret, are you? to 100 newspapers and all kinds of periodicals, a whole periodical section of a good library. And now I sit here and you tell me that going on the internet has turned someone parochial. I can connect. I have a thousand friends on my but Facebook. They don't. They don't and you're do telling that. me, wait a minute, will you that. let me finish? I can connect What's easily within seconds to a thousand people instantaneously at no cost. And you're telling me this device makes me parochial. I can contact a thousand people 
like that in a second. How does that make one molecule? Even as this lady was saying, it's all still compartmentalized. People are not what sitting going through. You know, I pick up a, a paper copy of the New York Times, and I don't care what the subject is, and there are subjects that it's about what's happening all over the world. I get both. And, and you, and you, you go through it. You, you don't just, the typical person going on the internet is like, I'm a gun nut. So I go to the gun support class. There's no difference or between the New York Times yeah. I get in our copy on my front porch than the one I get on my computer. <coughs> I don't know. Absolutely how, how not. That? That's a big, huge. I don't understand how that. They're the same newspaper. Oh, yeah. I know, but it's, it's huge. It's, it's the same. It's Twenty pages of print. How can you get that on the computer? How can case, I get it on the computer? You, Charlie. In any case, for people like myself, I underline because I'm a serious reader, and I underline. I cut out articles. I save them. And I use them when I make these presentations, okay? You can press print on a computer and print an article. <laughs> they have printers are we now. Are we through? Are we through? No. Your computer doesn't have a printer? Yeah. Yeah. Can we through? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you want to go to rebuttals now, Margaret? You want to go to rebuttals? Okay. Uh, who wants? Okay, I'll let me get up front All real right. quick. Okay. All right. All right. How many of us have rebuttals tonight? We're just going to make about a six or seven minute limit on it since we still have some time. So please speak your beast, but be coherent. We will be. Good thing. So, by the way, Margaret, I certainly believe that watching television, because you have so much choice available, makes you actually smarter, because you have to think about what you're going to watch. All right. It's going to be a soft clock, so um, I won't cut you right off, but please uh, keep going and say your piece. Uh, I wanted to say one thing about floodplains. I was in St. Paul about a year and a half ago, and I was uh, staying in a place that was right on the bank of the Mississippi River. And the Mississippi River, you stand up on the bank in St. Paul, and it's a long way away. The bank is about, oh, 100 feet or so, and then the river is going down in the middle of the valley, way, way down there. And what it meant to me was that there are times when the Mississippi River fills up that valley, maybe once in a hundred years, maybe once in a thousand years, but that valley was created by the Mississippi River. They were building apartment houses right down by the river. And I, I, I just couldn't imagine that people don't realize that that river is going to rise and it will, it, it will uh, destroy those apartment houses that they're building there very expensive homes right down in the floodplain of the Mississippi River. I uh, took geology in college and I resolved I would never buy a house in a floodplain. But then, uh, extenuating circumstances, I bought a house in Glenview by the Chicago River and sure enough, my house got flooded. And I thought, how come I forgot that I didn't want a house in a floodplain, you know? And I saw a house in Winnetka that was that had water up to the windows two years in a row. And anyway, I can't I can't imagine people not predicting that they are building in a floodplain. So um, that was what I wanted to say about floodplains. And then I wanted to talk about altruism because uh, somebody said that. Uh, evolutionarily we are altruistic but that part of our personality has to be cultivated and um, it, uh, usually our I think many of people our personalities are cultivated the other way either way is like part of our nature and we can go one way or the other according to how we 
uh, decide what kind of a person we decide we want to be. And I also think altruism is a lot easier one to one. Although when you contribute money to something like the Southern Poverty Law Center, I think that money is a symbol of your altruism that you don't want, that you want to try to prevent people from being poor. Uh, so the Southern Poverty Law Center? They're more about hate groups, aren't they? <laughs> uh, I might have that mixed up with some other group. Uh, yeah, they're about hate groups, but they're a big group. <laughs> well, he says they're corrupt. Oh, no, that's a lie. Okay, anyway, the, what I really wanted to talk about is why it's so difficult to make change. And uh, this, the talk tonight from uh, uh, Margaret didn't go the way I was thinking about this because um, I took a course in climate from the uh, University of California, San Diego. It was one of the best things I've ever done in my life. It was, a, it was an online course, and I took the course, and it was just so interesting, and I learned so much. But one of the things when I was doing research on this subject that I read was a paper by William Ruddiman. And William Ruddiman has, um, the, William Ruddiman has uh, studied climate for 8,000 years, and he also found that um, we began to miss uh, ice ages because there's an ice age every five or six thousand years and we began to miss ice ages about eight thousand years ago when people learned how to cut down trees and burn them and the regulation that the trees gave to the climate was uh, <laughs> began to be lost people cut down the trees and burned them. And for 8,000 years, we have been missing ice ages. <coughs> and so the thing that I think is important about that is 8,000 years ago, we learned to cut down trees and burn the wood for warmth and for heat. And that keeps the ice ages away? Yeah, it, it keeps the ice ages away. And people, uh, after 8,000 years, this becomes part of how we survive, and it becomes part of how we look at the world. Um, frankly, I think the people who learn how to cut down trees and burn them for warmth survived, and the others didn't, and this habit of using fossil fuels became part of our DNA. Uh, 8,000 years is a long time, and that's many, many, many human generations. This is where we got the habit of burning fuel to create warmth and energy for our lives. That's the reason it is so hard to change. It is not something that will come naturally to us to stop burning fossil fuels for heat. I have no idea how this will be changed. I think it's very discouraging when I hear people say, well, uh, we, we've, been burning, we've been burning fossil fuels now since the Industrial Revolution. No, we've been burning fossil fuels since 20 times before the Industrial Revolution. And it is part of our culture, it's part of our society, it's part of our way of life, it's part of why we have survived as a species. And I think it's gonna be really, really, I, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is nobody is facing the real challenge of helping us get over fossil fuels because People don't understand the depth of the problem that we have of burning fossil fuels. It's totally a part of who we are. And until we face that and decide we are not going to be like, I don't know, I mean, I'm talking to you right now. I don't know what to do about it. Is it okay if I call on somebody, Tim?
I mean, you know, you've been, it's been about seven minutes already. Okay, what did you want to say? Well, I just wanted to ask. Let's, let's get up and rebut. Let's get the next guy up, too, okay? okay. All, right. All right. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for speaking. All right. I just wanted to talk about left-wing propaganda. All this... Uh, uh, this climate uh, uh, solution, uh, solar and wind, is not going to, not the real answer. You still need natural gas and maybe even nuclear energy. And and uh, so far, solar and wind is only 20 percent. But these uh, uh, propagandists are saying that's to get rid of cars, get rid of planes. And that's that's ridiculous. Anyway, Medicare for all, Medicare for all. I had to wait 69 years to get Medicare. They want everybody. They're going to dilute the Medicare uh, payments. And then they don't want you to have your own private. I got blue, the best in the world, Blue Cross and Medicare. They want to take that away from us, us old people. And the Green New Deal is really a smokescreen for UN world government. They're behind this. They're, they're trying to destabilize the country and uh, weaken us. and. Uh, and uh, uh, have, uh, eventually they want UN world government, this globalization nonsense, all this left-wing propaganda. Immigration, 150,000 a month are coming over the, our, our southern border. We're the most generous country in the world. We bring in a million people every year legally, and over a million come in illegally. And that's all we want to stop. Trump wants to stop the Republicans. That's why I'm a Republican. I, we want to stop this illegal immigration. And if we need more people, we can give them green cards, let them come in. But these the dopers and, and uh, drugs and disease, talking about disease, this uh, doctor was talking about it the other day. And he was saying uh, Ebola virus, the countries from, are sending people over, that, that country has the Ebola virus. And uh, the Zika virus, the Zika virus, and uh, measles. We never had measles here in the United States for, for, for decades. Now we have an epidemic of measles. Why? It's not politically correct to say that these, uh, these, uh, ref these refugees coming over, and uh, I, I know there was a lot of disease in Central America, they're coming over. And uh, so my, my viewpoint is America is the greatest country in the history of the world. Yeah, yeah. Liberals and progressives are trying to tear it down. Yeah. Yeah. No! He's right. He's very right. No. Yeah. Yeah. Next, Jay. Got seven let's, bring, let's bring America back. Yes! There is a story about Teddy Roosevelt. I don't know if it's true or not. But supposedly he spoke to the DAR, Daughters of the American Revolution. He started out supposedly by saying, fellow immigrants, they never asked him to come back. And of course there are people, I think we just heard one, who believe this is the greatest country in the world yeah. every day in every way. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I am not one of those people. Uh, thanks, Margaret, for a good talk. I think Margaret would have been helped by having a moderator. We do have rules. Yeah. And I know Ron Basford wasn't a perfect moderator, but uh, we did follow some procedures. We had a question period, Bravo. and then we had a speaker, and then we had questions that ended in a question mark, and then we had rebuttals, and the rebuttals were separate from the questions. I think this is a very good system. I would love to see us go back to it. Don't ask me to be the moderator. I can't see the audience well enough. You need somebody who can really see and somebody who is a firm person. Thank you. OK. 
Okay. Oh, yeah, you want to switch. Seven right. minutes. Okay, say when. I'm uh, Ellen Corley, and uh, I always say I love this free speech forum because I think this is one of the solutions that we do have on the demand side. Um, this is my concept, what I was going to suggest and ask um, Jan about was, uh, you know, she, Lada and Margaret also said, I don't know what the solution is. I think, I've been thinking about this a lot as a kind of analyst, and um, <laughs> I used to be a market research analyst for big corporations. <coughs> I, also, my stepfather was a supply side economist, and so my hypothesis that I would like to propose is that we need to have supply side solutions. I think this problem comes from the supply side. The, they have adopted an economic philosophy of liberal 19th century liberalism or libertarianism or um, Ayn Rand free market theory that will just um, you know let it trickle down. This was the Gilder's idea of wealth and poverty. It it does not trickle down. Before that, that was in the 70s and 80s. We had you know there was a debate between Keynes and Hayek. There was an economic, you know, so they, that basically Keynes, who was the liberal, you know, the Roosevelt, that, you know, give this, flood the money. If you've got a depression, it's because the people don't have enough money to spend. You, they can't shop, they can't buy, they can't do anything. And so they're, they debated this, oh, should it be coming, you know, should we give the money to the managers and the bankers and the the top one percent or should we um give it to the bottom well as it turned out because of the lobbyists and the politics they got both parties say just let's give it to me politician lobbyist you know gas company everybody utilities um phone companies monopolies oil companies just give it to me and it'll, everything will go great. Well, the reason why Ida Tarbell figured out, she did all the research, I'm gonna, she's my idol, I'm gonna make a movie about her, but she wrote about it because her father was poor and she said, she figured it out, you know, Rockefeller and your oil monopoly, you know, you if, if you have all the power, you, you know, you'll lower the prices just long enough to put everybody else out of business and then you, raise the prices and you end up with a monopoly. Well luckily at the time people listened to her and they they put in antitrust laws, right? They put in um, and they broke up the things. There was a whole period where they put in regulations, the Glass Steagall Act. They separated the banks just being able to invest the money and squander it. No, if you have a savings bank and you can have you go invest somebody else's money. They threw that out. Now they they just, they don't, I did market research studies. Those supply side do not care if they have any consumers because they don't make any money off you. So they close all your banks, they merge. There's only one bank, the big old central bank octopus at the Federal Reserve that was put in there by Rothschild. It's a private bank. They make all the money they want by, by debt. And this has nothing to do with racism, okay? This is about debt. And debt is money and it's a system. So don't pull that one on me. It's an old Republican trick to say that, that this is an anti-Jewish thing. If I blame it on Rothschild, because Dulles was a Presbyterian and he helped him with it too. I'm a Southern Presbyterian and that has nothing to do with it, okay? So let's not buy into that. The truth is though, in 1776, those banks were, Thomas Jefferson said, that's why I distrust banks and I, and I believe we have to have a free press and we have to have freedom of speech and a free forum where we talk about these things openly and the solutions that other people don't want uh, to hear. Orwell said, say what they don't want you to say. And you know what they don't want us to say? That they don't, transparency. We need, they need to be audited. The Federal Reserve, read the creature from Jekyll Island. You know, read five million books on this. Griffin, 
they, every dollar, the whole system is, it needs to be a public debt system because right now it's all privatized and the, they don't care about the public and the public is starting to start. And people, oh, well, maybe they'll have a revolution. Well, no, that little idea of bowling alone is they're not going to, well, you know, we can't mobilize enough. But some people are working 10 hours a day. The rich are getting richer, and it's, it's not the rich, you're right, it's the corporation who doesn't even pay taxes. Believe me, I was a Republican at one point, okay? And I, I lived in the Jewish dorms. I'm all for money, right? Oppenheimer's my stepfather's company, a Jewish company. He's a white, the only guy there that wasn't. You know, I, that's all great. Until I realized, you realize there's corruption and nobody sees it, nobody wants to say it. It's difficult, especially when people are sending little trolls after you. One third on the internet traffic of people are trolls that go in there and say, you're Jewish, don't say anything. Are you anti-Semitic, you know, if you say that? So you, people can't make an argument that Israel, the United States, and it, and the England, after World War II, formed the Cold War and with the, the National Security Restoration Act and made a decision to have this enemy, Russia, and we are going to build bombs and we're going to do things that's nothing more than fascism, pure and simple. The same people that killed the Jews and were, were Ford, right, a Presbyterian, and he worked together with a lot of other people to kill the Jews. That's the problem, and they don't want you to lie and say anything about it, and so they'll discourage you. Oh, well, what are you saying? The, they sneer. The misinformation is one third of all the talk on the internet is lies, and most of it is fear mongering, attacking, saying things that aren't true. Once you put a big lie, Hitler said this: a big lie in the media, it, it the whole game was won. He controlled the media, and he kept those big lies going. And that's how that. And we don't even know. They didn't know what was going on when all this was going on. We didn't know what was going on. If we knew, if we were talking, if there was regulated free speech, like we had with the Fairness Doctrine in 1948, they put in a law that said, you know why? Because there was a Ku Klux Klan rally going out of, out of Mississippi radio station. And they said, okay, we know how to deal with this. We regulate it. It's called the Fairness Doctrine. If you can't, you, you've got the broadcast media, from the supply side, we'll control it. We take that license away from you if you are abusing it and you're not using the media for the public interest. This is all public interest law. They, the media, if they're going to put something in the newspaper and educate the public so that we can vote for the right people, for the right reasons, for the right policies, before we burn ourselves up in eight years, we have to have the newspapers and an intelligent, educated public. I'll end there. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. You went eight minutes. All right. Next. The uh, name of the presentation that we had tonight was called Why Are We Always Stuck with the Status Quo? Well, if you go down in the subway and you see a lot of cigarette butts, it's because people throw their cigarette butts on the floor. If you um, stop them from doing that, well, then they're liable to chew, chew uh, that uh, skull or that uh, chewing tobacco and spit on the floor. So then you might complain why do so many people spit on the floor. So what I'm saying to you is that the status quo is basically the sum total of what most of the people do. And that's why we'll always be stuck with the status quo, because the status quo is the sum total of what people do. That's all. All right, next. Very good. Everybody's bringing out a lot of facts, a lot of information. And well, there's just too much information for us to handle. There are computers that can handle a quadrillion calculations a second. 
That's a billion squared or a billion times a billion. I can't even begin to comprehend that kind of number. Knowledge is important, but even more important is wisdom. Knowing how to use the knowledge, knowing what it means to understand it. And then to understand something about it is Everybody wants all kinds of benefits, but they want the other guy to pay for it. And you know what government aid is like? Giving yourself a transfusion from your left arm to your right arm and filling and spilling 90% in between. <coughs> Excuse me. And too many people expect the other guy to do something. There's a story about some crows and a farmer. The little crow said to the mama crow, the farmer's talking about getting some neighbors to help harvest the crop tomorrow. He said, we don't have to move. Not yet, anyway. And then the baby crow said to the mother, uh, the next day, uh, he's bringing, asking more people to help him. And the mother said, we don't have to move. And the little crow came to the mother and said, he's going to do it today. He said he's going to do it himself tomorrow. Now we got to move. The most powerful weapon that you have available to you, bar none, is prayer. And prayer consists of three parts. One, you pray. But the most important part is that you listen to what answers that you get and open yourself to receive those answers. And then the third part is to obey. Remember, P-L-O. Pray, listen, and obey. And if you do that, you'll find your life is much easier. Yay! Next. I enjoyed your talk, Margaret. The only points I would make are, one, with regard to what you perceive as an excess of Navy carriers. The new carriers are being built to replace older carriers from the Nimitz class, which are about 30 or 40 years old. And the e-ships are on their way to being retired and decommissioned. And that's why we are building more carriers, so that they can be, the older ones can be replaced. Uh, with regard to the post office, you complained about it. we should get rid of Sunday delivery. No, we should not. What we should do is repeal the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970 and get rid of the Postal Service itself so it's run as a corporation that's supposed to make a profit. That never should have been done in the first place. The post office should be set up as a government agency and run in the most efficient manner possible so it provides the best service to the public. That's why the Postal Reorganization Act should be repealed and the old U.S. Post Office Department, the presidentially appointed Postmaster General, who serves in the cabinet, should be brought back. The only thing that I, part of what I favor keeping is A, the Postal Rate Commission, and two, merit selection of postmasters was established by an earlier 1969 statute. That also should be kept as we do not need the Postal Service being turned into a big Cook County. Uh, finally, with regard to the comment that was made about immigrants, well, folks, my forebears were immigrants. So were the forebears of most of you, not all of you. I view immigrants as an asset. They have changed for the better the way we eat and the way we live in many, other, in many, many ways. And my attitude is that anyone who has a problem with immigrants and immigration well, they can go back to the countries that their forebears came from. All right, next. Oh, this was a. The word, your words have such an impact. Oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> yeah. This guy is in <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's see now. 
occasionally some some people will uh, sometimes say something that for me personally is so uh, rises to a level of offense that I feel like I have to respond. Uh, there was a comment uh, specifically about uh, immigrants and one of the problems is that they are bringing diseases into this country. Um, two diseases that were mentioned were measles and um, Ebola. So uh, I haven't read, I've read quite a bit about the increase in measles in this country and I've heard zero doctors reference the immigration, the connection to the immigrant problem or specifically the illegal immigrant problem. Uh, they all seem to be pointing at the, uh, the rise in the rejection of um, people getting, giving measles shots to their kids, which is a direct result of the science denialism behind um, uh, people uh, getting uh, the, uh, all the shots for their kids. So no, no connection I've ever read about uh, immigration or illegal immigration. Uh, the second thing about Ebola, I've read nothing about Ebola. Uh, Ebola is a, is, I mean, it's a terrific way to terrify people. If you want to terrify somebody, just mention the word Ebola and connect it to whatever you want, whatever topic. You don't like plants? Connect plants to Ebola. If you don't like, uh, if you don't like sunshine, connect sunshine to Ebola. You'll, you're guaranteed to scare the crap out of people. But if we're talking about facts, I haven't read anything where they're talking about uh, illegal immigrants bringing in Ebola and not having referenced it, but using logic, I'll explain why. Uh, most illegal immigrants spend a tremendous amount of time trying to work their way over to this country. They don't have money, okay? Ebola has a re really quick incub incubation period, okay? So the, pr so the threat to Ebola is not these Ill illegal immigrants spending weeks and months coming to this country. The threat are, are, are legal immigrants and international travelers who are hopping on a jet and flying halfway around the world in 12 hours. That's where Ebola is going to come in. This whole idea of taking Ebola and trying to terrify people and falsely connect it to illegal immigrants is, uh, I find it offensive. So that's my thing on uh, illegal immigrants. Um, uh, I, I have one disagreement with Margaret's uh, talk regarding uh, war. She was she blamed a whole bunch of people for uh, uh, for wanting war, and, and she was right on every single person that she talked about. But she forgot to mention one group of people who love war, and that is Americans. Mm -hmm. Americans like war. If you look at the second Iraq war, they did polls, and how many people supported the second invasion of Iraq? They say 90% of Americans supported it. Now, I just want to give kudos to the people here. How many people here protested that war? Because, yeah, okay. So I know there are a fair number here. I was down at the Daily Center for the protests, but there just weren't enough of us. There's something about the human being, their, their existence, that just gets them all worked up really easy. And the fact that we have a lot of media that wasn't doing fact checking um, seemed to really just get people all worked up and drove us into a war that was destructive in so many ways I don't want to start going into it. A lot of people have already talked about it. It's, it's well it's about a bunch of stuff. But that's my that's my one thing that I think Margaret left out. Um, so finally, you know, if I had if I had to make a list of things to recommend, it's like there I, I agree with so much of what Margaret was talking about. So what are the solutions? So uh, she did mention one thing, she talked about a balanced budget, doing a balanced budget, but giving uh, the, the leadership uh, if during uh, emergency situations to change that rule. I think that that's a great place to start. So many of our budget problems now are politicians who are just either spending or not paying bills, and now we have so much, such a huge chunk of our uh, expenditures that are required to be directed through paying off bills. It's just nuts. And the millions of people are getting hurt for it. So that's one solution I think is required. 2008, we ended up bailing out companies that couldn't fail. Okay? And from what I've read, nothing's been done to prevent a future, a future repeat of this. So what I'd suggest is coming up with some kind of economic and legal definition of what a company is that cannot fail and then passing a law that pre prevents it. 
outlaw companies, if the company has grown so big that the government has to subsidize them if they fail, then that company is too big. And that's, I think, another solution. An another solution is the, uh, the consolidation of media. I think we have a huge problem because right now there's too few corporations controlling almost all of the media in, in this country. And they're just looking, their big motivation of the, of the corporate heads is to make money. And you can see that in the quality of the information that's reaching the public. And I think that we have to, uh, we have to start taking uh, antitrust laws and applying them to media outlets. Um, the, we, can't we can't afford to have an uneducated public who's voting and supporting for politicians and trying to decide on uh, make, make well-informed uh, decisions about important um, policy issues. So, and then the, li the last thing I think that is needed is, is to look at this thing that's happening now and that, that we seem to be so angry on both sides of the aisle. And there's so much motivation uh, that's motivated by anger. Mm -hmm. And politicians seem to be feeding into this, and media organizations seem to be feeding into this, and, and the internet seems to be feeding on this. It, it, what's the way to, to get people, who, the, maybe sociologists and psychologists, and try to have a national discussion and, and looking at why, why we're so angry at people who don't agree with us? And, uh, and how we can better figure out how to sort of find some way to meet the middle. So, those are my ideas. Excuse me, Dave. I was saying that I was saying that they come from Ebola countries. I didn't say they're coming from yeah, Ebola they countries. Got yeah. You know what I'm saying? They're coming from Ebola. Ebola. They're coming from Africa illegally. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's like it's you. You. I really don't like to talk to you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you that sometimes <coughs> what we're facing today is nothing new. In the 19th century, there were no television, aeroplanes, computers, or spacecraft. Neither were there antibiotics, credit cards, microwave ovens, or mobile phones. There was, however, an internet. During Queen Victoria's reign, a new communications technology was developed to allow people to communicate almost instantly across great distances, in effect shrinking the world faster and further than ever before. A worldwide communications network whose cables spanned continents and oceans, it revolutionized business practices, gave rise to new, York, new forms of crime, and inundated its users with a deluge of information. Romance blossomed over the wires. Secret codes were devised by some users and cracked by others. The benefits of the network were relentlessly hyped by its advocates and dismissed by its skeptics. Governments and regulators tried and failed to control the new media. Attitudes to everything from news gathering to diplomacy had to be completely rethought. Meanwhile, out on the wires, a technological subculture with its own customs and vocabulary was being used. Does all this sound familiar? Today, the internet is described as an information superhighway. Its 19th century precursor, the electric telegraph, was dubbed the highway of thought. Modern computers exchanged bits and bytes along network cables. Telegraph messages were spelled out in dots and dashes by Morse code and sent along wires by human operators. The equipment may have all been different, but the telegraph's impact on its lives of its users was strikingly similar. The telegraph allow unleashed the greatest revolution in communications since the development of the printing press. Modern internet users are in many ways the heirs of the telegraphic revolution, which means that today we are in a unique position to understand the telegraph, and the telegraph in turn can give us fascinating perspectives on the challenges, opportunities, and pitfalls of the internet. The rise and fall of the telegraph is a tale of scientific discovery 
technological cunning, personal rivalry, and cutthroat competition. It is also a parable about how we react to new technologies. For some people, they tap a deep vein of optimism on others and then find new ways to commit crime, initiate romance, or make a fast buck. Age-old tendencies that are all too often blamed on the technologies themselves. King Solomon said it best, there is nothing new under the sun. The technologies that have come to play are fueled by the same vices, greed, aspirations that have been around for centuries. My point is the fact that what we're seeing is nothing new. But in fact, we should be exceedingly hopeful because humans have made a lot of progress in the last 100 years. You know, we have, are in the best position in years to really do things like wipe out world poverty, like get worldwide literacy going. In essence, develop. As long as we keep this revolution of globalization alive with free trade and free movement of funds and capital and people, I think we're going to be in the best position to make it a really bright new century. Children working in and you know, Charlie, there's a lot less of them than there were, and a lot of them stay a lot more healthier than they did 100 years ago. My point is, I embrace technology. I embrace the technology and the internet. It's given more information to more people and done more to democratize the world than most of the past technologies combined. You know, we had the printing press, we had the telegraph, and now we have a telephone. But still, what's the best way to spread information? Tell a woman. <laughs> Cold in here, you know. There it is. All right, Charlie. Let's get get you yeah, your, your words of wisdom. For globalization, <laughs> so we can get plenty of jobs. And as it says in Proverbs, in a fool is not interested in understanding, yeah, but only in the revealing of his own mind. Yeah. All right, I'm not going to read to you from the internet, but let's thank our speaker for a very nice presentation here. I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. I heard something here that she said she had a definition of human nature. It's amazing. I, there's about eight commonly accepted definitions in philosophy of what you would call human nature. And when I hear this, it's, it's usually, uh, why is it that someone's theory, human nature always matches perfectly with the theory that you're advancing? So uh, that's, the, that's how you define human nature. <laughs> Uh, it's not the other way around, but it's probably that humans are basically defined. Uh, Marx probably was, Karl Marx was among these theorists of philosophy that said you define by the circumstances or the society or the arrangements of the society in which you find yourself. That will largely do, will determine how you will behave and your actions, and that's probably the most accurate one here. Um, regarding also human nature, that humans are selfish. Um, a few years ago, I did a talk here on evolution. It's a number of quite a few years ago, actually. And I spent months studying evolution and the theories of Charles Darwin. Um, as a matter of fact, and though he has pivoted generally to find this. Uh, survival of the fittest is a ruling thing, which would be selfishness in a sense. There's plenty, if not more, evidence of altruistic behavior in nature, which is the problematic for the theory of evolution, is that there is in fact altruistic behavior commonly found at all levels, that society, family, the nuclear family, up to the tribe, and all the way to the modern nation state for that matter, and even among collections of nations today. Um, 
the uh, anybody knows that uh, you say everyone is selfish, but then again, I always know that in nature there's one bird that will squawk and warn the flock that the eagle is coming, and even that bird may get killed, but the flock is able to escape. Anybody knows that incident takes place in nature in many situations here. Uh, regarding legislation, uh, to say that all legis most legislation, I, as a matter of fact, dedication to argue with the libertarian on this, is that very little legislation affects the person voting for the legislation or his or her constituents. Most legislation does not apply to everybody within let's say the United States, or the district, or the city or municipality. It applies, like especially congressional legislation. Uh, it's regional in nature, uh, very specific to a particular group. Uh, but it's almost difficult, I was thinking, to find a piece of legislation that applied to every single person, which a libertarian was maintaining was the only appropriate legislation that could be passed. Because they said, well, that's a selfish political doctrine. But they maintain that the only legislation that would be authorized is that it did something for me. If it didn't do anything for me, then it shouldn't be passed. And I said, well, you're never going to find a law like that. Hardly any of them exist in that fashion. OK, now another thing that kind of interests me, got me thinking here, was about somehow we're in isolation. Now, years ago, the only way to, to deal with other people was maybe to meet with them personally, and you could call, talk with them. You could converse. Or perhaps you could exchange letters, send each other's letters. Later along, came Tim had on it, a telegraph, not much communication there, not much information conveyed. But then again, they came along with a telephone. So then you could transverse distances. Uh, and converse, and you're no longer in isolation. Then we come along with the internet, and there's virtually no isolation whatsoever. As a matter of fact, now here's the amazing thing, you're telling me there's a thing called social media, and then you're saying, is isolationism. Well, why do they call it social media? If anything, people are interacting. They may not be interacting at a very high level, but they are, in fact, interacting. And the other thing about the Internet, I don't know, I, librarians, you know, it's a, it's a method of securing information. Like you, you said, well, there's websites. It used to be, I, used, I remember one time I had a project. I was trying to, like, get the literature table here. I contacted <laughs> 25 or 50 organizations to get their brochure. I don't have to do that today because they have something called websites. Now, that certainly is an advantage. But in the old days, we did things too. This is certainly a thing. I don't have got no problem with that whatsoever. But anyhow, thank you very much for your thoughts and things like that. I don't have any fear about the budget. We've seen the, you know, come surface from these from time to time. Um, there has not been any crisis. Um, the, in, in, in the budget, the inherent flaws are in the capitalist system, Timmy. Uh, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the deficit or the budget in the United States. It seems to be precipitated by the capitalist fascist Wall Street money markets. Thank you very much. All right. I guess we don't want no disease people. You want to speak? Keep them out. All right. Uh, yeah. Margaret, I think you get the last word. Uh, you get the last word. Yeah. Go in here, man. Yeah. Yeah. The temperature came down. I'll be over. I'll be over. Okay. How about that going a little army? <laughs> uh, just draw a few uh, years that I uh, picked up from the rebellions. Uh, altruism, it must be coordinated. Yes, that's true. 
Some of the older ones are due for retirement. Okay. Now, I really question this because I just, first of all, I question the advisability of even having aircraft carriers, and certainly are yeah. not at that price tag. I think it's very $55 billion it can be correct. And I have a true criticism that they're silly ducks, and are they really necessary, or are they just a way to go around the world and look like a big shot? Yeah. Um, the Americans favor war. I I don't quite. I don't believe that. I don't believe that particularly the average American does. Um, the quality of can't read my notes too well. The quality of information. Uh, there is nothing wrong with the quality of the information we get from print media. I know this for a fact. I can tell you it. They can very well inform. You read the Economist. You read the Week. You read the. Um, Whatever, you know, whatever magazine, it's a whole big choice of magazines, of newspapers, uh, at least if you live in a big city like this, I know the smaller cities have lost their newspapers, so I don't think it's correct to say that um, monopolies are causing us to lose our uh, print news we get, they are the environment of the sources, uh, telegraph and all that, and then uh, social media, as a substitute for in-person relationships, no way on earth. All right, dismiss us. Just cut, cut, tell us to uh, call, gavel us out. Oh, you got to gavel us out. Gavel us out. Dismiss us. The meeting's over. Have a good night. All right. Thank you.